Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to welcome you on the second day of the Water for Food Conference here to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, and as you may know, those of you locally here I know know this well. Our visitors from around the world may know this less. This is our 150th anniversary year of this great university. Uh, we were founded in 1869 here in Lincoln, Nebraska, when Lincoln was really a fledgling little few buildings on the prairie in a brand new state that had just become a state in the U.S. two years previously. And since then, we have grown up into a phenomenal institution, a world-leading land-grant institution where 26,000 students study with us here, uh, with our 6,300 faculty and staff. Those students, much like this conference, come from all over the world, 136 countries around the world represented on our campus, and every state in the U.S. So a big year for us, a celebratory year here in 2019 uh, that we're very proud of marking the impact of the university. And I would encourage you to go over to the mill, the coffee location just to the north of us here in Innovation Commons where there's an exhibit there uh, that does tell the history and the story of the University of Nebraska uh, for those of you that might want to learn more about our great institution. Uh, you heard Mike Bame say in opening the conference yesterday that there is really no place like Nebraska. We often say that in relation to our football stadium, but in this case, you know, I'm referring to the fact that there really is no place like Nebraska when it comes to water and food. Mike described for you the fact that as you go east to west in this state, you cross five agroecological zones as you go up in altitude, and as he said yesterday, that is a greater diversity than you experience going east to the Atlantic Ocean uh, here from the location in Nebraska. And as he also talked about, the vast array of groundwater resources and surface water resources that exist over this state is unparalleled anywhere else, so we believe, in the universe. And as a result of that, water and food are inextricably linked in the DNA of Nebraska. So as you uh, know, the institute that we're here celebrating through this conference was initially the vision of Robert Dougherty. And Robert Dougherty had the vision that bringing together policymakers, scientists, entrepreneurs, producers uh, into, a, <clears throat> into a conversation and a dialogue would allow us to really confront the major challenges that, that uh, do uh, present themselves in our ability to have a water and food secure world long term. Now I had the opportunity of being here at the very beginning of this journey, uh, literally the announcement of the formation of the Water for Food Institute and the initial gift from the Dougherty Foundation happened in April of 2010. I joined the university as the Vice Chancellor of INR, the position that Mike now holds, in July of 2010 and had the opportunity to kind of see this institute come together and to grow into the world-leading <clears throat> class institute that it is today. And I remember so well the vision and the foresight that some of those founders had, uh, including Moens Bai, including J.B. Milliken, the former president of the University of Nebraska, including uh, Bob Meany from Valmont, uh, including Prem Paul, our late great friend who led the research enterprise here at the university, for a, a long time. And I distinctly remember traveling the world, developing those partnerships with many of you in the room here, in India, in Brazil, in Indonesia, in China, at IHE Delft, uh, and working in the water community around the world as we shaped the Institute uh, over that period of time to follow. And I'm very, very proud of what the Institute has become here at the university and with all of the partners <clears throat> that we're working with uh, here and abroad around the world. So I, I would like to just start to remember in gratitude all of those founders, all of those people who have brought this institute together to give a round of applause for them because we're very, very proud 
of what the Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute has become. Now, I know you're going to have the opportunity for a lot of continuing rich dialogue today. I understand that you had a wonderful evening last night at the State Museum at Morrill Hall, uh, which also gave you an opportunity to really learn more about this great place called Nebraska, and I know that you have a great day ahead of you. And to get us started this morning, I'm going to ask Mike Bame to come forward who will recap the day yesterday for you and will plot out the advance of what you're going to learn today. Welcome to Nebraska. Have a great rest of the conference. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, for day two. Uh, as Ronnie said, did, did you have a good evening last night in the museum? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I'm, I said yesterday I'm a plant pathologist, so while I knew about Pangea and continental drift and that kind of uh, stuff, I've only been a Nebraskan for three years, so to, to see that museum and to actually, I knew about the Great Salt Lake, Mike and Mike, but I didn't have an appreciation that Nebraska was part of a great waterway connecting the Arctic with uh, what we would call the Gulf of Mexico, and it had helped me understand the complexity of our geology, the sand hills in the middle of the state, uh, the Rocky Mountains, the Front Range, and really that water story. So we're glad that you were able to experience that, uh, that amazing uh, asset that we have here. Well, yesterday was quite an amazing day, and, and I'll, I'll recap what spoke to me yesterday. We had some amazing plenary sessions. Uh, we had some great breakout sessions. Uh, we got a chance to uh, listen to entrepreneurs that are really pushing the envelope. Entrepreneurs from Nebraska, entrepreneurs from sub-Saharan African countries. We heard from the Clinton Foundation of how critical it is to put practice, uh, theory into practice by actually being boots on the ground. We heard from individuals from Malawi and Ethiopia, uh, from Rwanda, um, we heard even from Dr. Spock, yes, Jim, this is irrigation, just not as, not as we've seen before. Uh, it was quite a, a stimulating day. We also heard about the importance of uh, social perspectives. That coffee cup that said 80% um, 80 water and, and the attitudes of people. So while we're thinking, and this room is filled with engineers, it's filled with scientists, with biotechnologists, with plant scientists that are pushing the envelope. The reality is that science and engineering solutions will only get us so far. And then we need to we blend that with the human condition and what it means to be human and how we, we see the world around us. And we heard a lot of that yesterday, which was really um, quite amazing. Today, You'll hear a couple of stories, uh, main, main uh, stories. One, Steve Nelson, who's the president of the Nebraska Farm Bureau, will share with you, as I mentioned yesterday, the World Bank's estimate that nine out of all, all every 10, nine of every 10 natural disasters, Steve, is connected to water in one form or another. And I mentioned to you, and Peter mentioned in his comments, this flooding of epic historic proportions. And I want to just uh, set that stage a little bit for you so you have some context given your interest in water. We just didn't feel that it would uh, be right for 350 colleagues, friends from around the world coming to Nebraska and not talk about this water event that's taking place. It started Actually, I would say after a historic winter of snowfall here in Nebraska, uh, record amounts of snow uh, coming down across the state. It was a cold winter uh, in Nebraska. And I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I know cold. It was a cold winter. And uh, then what happened early, uh, maybe the 11th or so, 10th, 11th, we began getting uh, information from the National Weather Service that there was this thing called a bomb cyclone. I'd never heard of a bomb cyclone. Uh, but a bomb cyclone is basically, uh, think about hurricane or typhoon force winds 
mixed with feet, uh, two, three feet of snow, all happening at the same time. The saving grace of this was that the, the forecasting models have gotten a lot better over the years. And we had plenty of warning. And this was really impacting the western part of Nebraska. As you can see, um, this is a basic clicker. It's got a big green button to go forward and one button to go back. But uh, if you can pick out Nebraska up there and look all the way to the west, to your, to your left, um, you'll see what looks like a panhandle. And it's that panhandle that was in the eye of this bomb cyclone. Unfortunately, it also then moved across the upper parts of, of Nebraska into South Dakota, uh, Wyoming, and Iowa. And it deposited quite a bit of snow. It was in that time when we were sending out messages to our colleagues and reaching out to our friends that were in the beginning, early stages of calving here in Nebraska, where our mama cows were having their babies and those babies are out on the great, great prairie, susceptible to cold weather and so forth. Unfortunately, however, after the bomb cyclone, the, the water, the rain came and the water um, and the ice followed. And this picture that I'm showing you here is from our uh, Nebraska Emergency Management Association or agency showing um, flooding. And you can see that this was just uh, simply not a Nebraska issue, but the entire uh, upper Midwest was being impacted, which um, just the scale uh, was enormous. This is a satellite image, uh, pre and post um, uh, flooding, if you will. Um, you'll see on the one side what our, I mentioned yesterday, we have 80,000 miles of streams and rivers. Our surface water assets are incredible. But you can see the swollen, uh, the swollen rivers and tributaries on the, uh, on the other slide. It was quite fascinating. As, as I already mentioned, uh, we had a very cold winter, so we had very thick ice. Uh, this is actually mild. Uh, we had a dam in, in northeast Nebraska, a uh, 99-year-old dam that actually broke. And it sent literal icebergs, um, three, four tons in weight, six, seven, eight feet in depth, flowing down rivers, through homes, through cities, taking out bridges. It was uh, uh, quite, quite devastating. And uh, of course, um, thankfully, we lost only three humans. But the toll on livestock, um, both swine and cattle, um, were much more significant. Bridges moved off their moorings and, and, and flowed downstream, taking out whatever was in the way. Communities, um, this is a, a rural community, completely flooded. Um, as we think about, back to Rob's comments from two years ago, the pernicious cycle of poverty, you don't have to go anywhere. Just look in, in your own neighborhood, in your own state. We had um, some of the most susceptible individuals living in the lowlands next to the rivers, a common theme across the globe that were, um, were impacted greatly. Our farming communities also wiped out and, and in, in some significant ways. I think yesterday I mentioned 500,000 acres are projected to have been impacted, 300, 350,000 of those uh, dealing directly with pasture land, range land, or farms. I share this slide to pivot to the next bit, farmers helping farmers. So we have had an outpouring from across the country uh, of, of people helping others. It's been quite uh, heartfelt, um, quite, quite warm. And Steve will talk about this response and talk about some of the complexities, everything from understanding the water uh, dynamics, but also soil uh, tilth, soil health. Some of our fields have now five, four, five, six feet of sediment, uh, things buried in the sediment some uh, toxicities, uh, our rail has been impacted, our roads, our highways have been impacted, um, our, our natural system of uh, 
feeding, uh, making ethanol and feeding cattle, DDGs, distillers grain, getting that moved around, it's all been disrupted. The mental well-being and the public health needs that are out there are, are tremendous, and Steve will talk about this. We'll also then pivot to hear from the World Bank. Yesterday we heard a lot about scalability, and uh, I was in one of the sessions that talked about scaling um, technological advances, and so the World Bank has been instrumental in this. Two years ago, give or take, uh, we had 11 representatives of the World Bank here, and we heard from a representative yesterday to talk about the Nebraska story and how we might take elements of the Nebraska story and that technology and those economic models and those business models and how we scale it to take around the globe to help um, producers, small scale producers, uh, larger scale producers, countries move forward. And then we'll close this evening with um, Mark um, Rose Grant. Uh, Mark is new to me, but not to you, an international expert in food security, water security, and sustainability and resilience of communities. And Mark will give our closing plenary this evening, which I just want to give you a heads up. We'll also serve or be double uh, hatted as the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources Hewerman Lecture Series. This is a lecture series. We have typically three per year. So Mark will, Mark will be providing that, um, that uh, lecture at the same time. I share that with you because we expect some of our neighbors, our colleagues from the university and around Nebraska to join us. And so I don't want, any, I don't want you to be surprised when the room starts filling up. It will also be telecast and live streamed across Nebraska and across the world, so that's quite a treat. And then we'll close the, the evening uh, with uh, an amazing event um, next door where we'll have uh, music and a chance to continue to get to know each other and ponder the thoughts that we heard today. So with that, I welcome you to the second day of our water conference. And I want to close on one thing. On the drive home last night, Ronnie was talking about um, feeling uh, that sense of gratitude. And I would just like to say to you, thank you. Um, we talk a lot about uh, uh, privilege. And we talk about being uh, in the 2% of the world's population that has, the, has been blessed to go and receive advanced degrees. You are using that privilege that you have every day to help make the world a better place. And that's important. And so I want to say um, thank you to you for what you do today and what you do uh, every day. Thanks.